Our guest today is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. He has served in that role for nearly three and a half years. He is past president, publisher, and chief executive officer of the Los Angeles Times. Prior to that, our guest today was president, publisher, and chief executive officer of the Chicago Tribune Company. He earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard College and his law degree from Harvard Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, David Hiller. David? All right, we have fun up here. Right. Thank you, Jay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to be back at the City Club. And uh, speaking of uh, board of directors, uh, members, I have uh, three of them here, and I'd like to introduce them to uh, Dennis Fitzsimon, that's our board chair, Don Wycliffe, and Scott Smith. Don and Scott, stand up. So, how many people in the room watched the debates last night? Pretty good uh, turnout. How many people this morning read about them in a newspaper? In print? Online? All right. Well, that's some of the subject that I want to uh, talk about today, and it's basically uh, the, the news media and its relationship to our civic life. And specifically, I want to tackle what's happened to the news and what's happened to all of us who are news consumers and what are the stakes involved and, and finally, what can we all do about it as citizens. In full disclosure, actually, Jay made the repeated disclosures, I uh, come at this partly as a recovering newspaper publisher. <laughs> Never fully recovered, believe me. And uh, currently as part of a foundation that works in the area of news and, and journalism and civic engagement. But I'd like to begin with a personal news story that will illustrate some of what we're talking about today. Here is the Huffington blog that greeted me when I became publisher of the Los Angeles Times. <laughs> That was just the first day. <laughs> and, and it illustrates us a few of the things about our digital age. First of all, as we know, there are a lot of facts and dots floating around out there, and people can get to connect them up in whatever they, wa they want. And in fact, I went to law school and knew, knew and know John Roberts. I did work with him and Ken Starr in the Justice Department. But right wing hatchet man? I would say not by today's elevated standards. <laughs> I wouldn't even come close. <laughs> and you should see what my own LA Times wrote about me. <laughs> Any case, enough about me. So Jerry didn't want me to bury the lead about does news still matter. We believe uh, strongly that it does. But I thought, um, we would ask some of our fellow Americans what they think. And to make this a little bit more interesting, um, we're going to have a contest and uh, see if any of you can identify who the speakers were. And I'm going to eliminate a few people. I'm going to eliminate Gary Johnson from the History Museum. <laughs> and I'm going to eliminate the Trib Tribune table. Uh, so here's the first statement. This individual said and paraphrased, I would choose newspapers without a government. Thomas We've got Jay and, and the sister, you also, yes, Thomas Jefferson. And what I should have said, we, and we have Starbucks cards from Ashley for the winners. <laughs> sister. So yes, this was uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was, well, Jeffersonian in his skepticism of government but he really knew the dangers of having a government that was unchecked by the news media in his day, all newspapers. All right, let's try another. And this is, we have, we have, we have another, we have several more cards. So who said, 
Let the people know the facts, and the country will be safe. No, but you're right to think presidential. Lincoln. Lincoln. Good. Well done. Abraham Lincoln, who, as many of you would know, during the Civil War was one of the most vilified of any president in our whole history uh, by the press, and yet, on balance, had a pretty good record, even in wartime, of supporting the press's freedom to say what they wanted to about him. So let's try a couple more. Here's another. Who said this? Tip O'Neill. No, no, not Tip. But you're, but you're, 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 you're close. You're the right ethnicity. Yes, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. There was a group of. I don't know if we have enough cards, but, but it was close. You, you also heard Mitt paraphrase him last night. And this really does get at one of the challenges of the media and public life today. It's the you know, we're all used to everybody having their own opinion, but these days, increasingly, it seems people are asserting their own sets of facts. All right, so here's uh, one other. Who said this? <laughs> Mark Twain. Good. Well done, Charlie. You got it. Mark Twain. And this was in the age of lies moving halfway around the world on steamship and telegraph. You can only imagine what he would have thought today. Well, anyway, I considered making this speech entirely out of other people's quotes. <laughs> but I decided I wouldn't. So what's the problem here today? So there have always been these issues of how to separate lies and truth and facts and fiction and spin. So what's new? Well. A big part of it is the sheer volume that we're dealing with. It is literally, I think, a lot of us experience this phenomenon. But you know, in a way, it's been building for, for 500 years. If you were around in the years following Gutenberg, you probably would have said, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with all these books, right? And then shortly thereafter, there came the first newspapers, and then more newspapers, and then telegraph and radio and TV and then internet, the internet. Unlike what I, what I first believed when I was still a, a publisher about the internet, that the internet was going to be just one more thing and basically additive and, you know, we'll deal with it like everything else, I've decided that was way <laughs> wrong. There really, there really is nothing like what we've seen in the change that's been brought by the uh, internet. Part of it is the sheer astronomical volume of what we face. Three, 300 billion emails every day. And those are just mine. <laughs> this one I thought was a mess. 72 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. Every minute. All those dogs with dancing things on <laughs> And then get this, <clears throat> I read this statistic, I don't know who calculates this kind of thing, but now every two days, every two days, we create as much information in gigabytes and terabytes as we did for the last 2,000 years. It's just, it's staggering. And beyond the volume, it's, the, it's that it's continuous, it's everywhere, it's mobile, and it's networked. I mean, literally, as we see, everybody in the world is connected with everybody else. So you all know this story. But I, to illustrate some of what's happening to the news, I want to share with you a more modern take on how this story would be reported today. This is by our friends at the Guardian newspaper. Now being taken into custody, so the spotlight is once again 
that shone on the grey area of homeowners' rights to protect their properties. This isn't right. The three little pigs are the victims. Oh, three down two houses. You've got what you deserve. But the pigs went too far. Oh, you have every right to defend your property. Oh, chinny chin chins up, fellas. Boiling someone alive hardly constitutes reason. Somebody's force. going to break the law and intrude on you. Yeah, protect yourself in your own home. A man's home is his castle. <laughs> Someone tried to blow my house down, I'd do the same. I knew the wolf. There's no way you could have blown down those houses. He had asthma. But the wolf had asthma. So what's the truth about the pigs' houses being blown down? Inside job. There's no reason why those two houses, one made from straw, the other from wood, should have collapsed. Not even a healthy wolf's huff and puff could bring them down. The three little kids have confessed to conspiring to commit insurance fraud, framing the wolf in an attempt to cover their tracks. Their motive was financial, as they struggled to keep up with their mortgage repayments. So, that's the news story of the three little pigs. And it's, yeah, again, credit to the, uh, the, the talented people at the, the Guardian of uh, London. You know, and it is, it is funny, but it does really show, I mean, that's how, that's how news gets reported and travels around the, the world today. So what's the uh, impact on all of this? of all of this on us. Well, first of all, we know it changes behavior, and we're going to get into some of that, with the, particularly among our younger people. Um, but um, one f phenomenon is that there's uh, research being done that's actually changing the way that our brains are wired and, and work. And this uh, book by a, a researcher, Nicholas Carr, called The Shallows, makes that point. And his point is all the the twitches and the volume and the email and the and the grazing and the and the multitasking uh, makes it harder and harder and harder for individuals to sustain attention mm -hmm. and follow lengthy narrative argument and thought that's typically been the form of journalism uh, over the years. And I don't know whether it's strictly true or not, but it's an area where I think important research will be being done about how we process information and, and where kids get the news. Um, one other um, um, phenomenon that you, you see, and I think all of us witness this, is that the media is not only fragmenting, it's polarizing. And together with the pattern that people increasingly seek out the media that they agree with or agrees with them, it can reinforce a lot of the biases and sometimes even create these pockets of everybody having their own uh, facts and what we witness increasingly is very uh, high levels of incivility in the news. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, the, the reality is that our life is, civic life, is filled with issues that are susceptible of being turned upside down and inside out and inflamed and, and lied about. And this is uh, just a collage of some that have just happened in the last year or so. So what do most of us think of all this? Well, pretty much I expect what your reaction is uh, to this. The vast majority of people don't feel uh, always informed. They feel overwhelmed. And they feel that a lot of the media is biased, and they feel that the media world is extremely uncivilized, and in fact, in some of these polls have said way less civilized even than some of the live political discussions themselves. So that's bad enough for all of us in the room, but what about the next generation of citizens? Well, first of all, where do they get their news these days? There's a recent USC Annenberg LA Times poll from this past August, is that 52% of millennials get their news from Facebook, 37% from television, either broadcast or cable, and 20% from Jon Stewart. <laughs> and I actually expect that 20% is low. So the sources and the habits and where kids go for news are all different. And so when they get their news, what do they think about the news? Well, here's what. They say there's a new book out, Millennials, News and Social Media, out of the University of Texas. And these are some of the descriptions and terms that the millennials have used. 
But here's a ray of light in all this. The, even the, the young people have the sense that, that they are getting overwhelmed, but they actually say overwhelmingly that they would like to find some help in sorting out all these things, in trying to know what to believe and what not to believe. So if you think of the news media as part of the marketplace of ideas, we separate some of this into the supply side issues and the demand side issues. On the supply side, you've got the need and the work that journalists like Jerry and Bruce and, and uh, Jim Kirk at the Sun-Times and their colleagues and other broadcast and online are doing. And there's certainly a lot of work that needs to be done in improving the, the quality and the availability of investigative news, particularly the, this check on on government that, that only the, the press can provide. And we do, we do work with some people in, the, in this uh, area, including the Chicago Reporter locally, the Center for Public Integrity, the new Watchdog Project up at Medill that also partners with the, with the Tribune. But for today, I'm going to leave that to Jerry and, and Bruce, and I want to focus on the demand side of the marketplace, and specifically this need and uh, opportunity that we have to help educate the next generation of citizens how to be good consumers of news on their way to being informed and engaged citizens and members of the community. So we call this news literacy. It goes by a variety of different names elsewhere. But it's that simple core concept that how do we equip people with the capacity to deal with all this stuff that's coming at them and navigate it and find the information and the, and the news that they need and to disregard the rest. Okay, so I have just one more quote that I want to use because it's a great one. This, this one comes, and I wasn't certain about the specific individual. It wasn't actually a Mike Royko quote, but Mike got his start, like so many great journalists in Chicago, the City News Bureau, where I think one of the legendary night editors used to say this, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. And uh, they were pretty tough. <laughs> but the uh, point was that in a way it really captures the essence of the idea of news literacy is this healthy, curious skepticism, not cynicism, but skepticism on the way to inquiring and getting the news and information that you, that you need. So. Um, that's what news literacy uh, does, and it's got a number of different elements, and there's a curriculum that you're going to hear a little bit more about. And it, it, it gets the students to be reflective about their own news uses, what their, what their diet is. They think about sources and evaluate credibility. Typically, in these programs, they create some of their own uh, media and tell stories that are relevant and important to them and their families and the community. They learn about the First Amendment and how special it is to be in a country that has one and, and enforces it. And again, connects this to the building the, the engagement, the, the sense of capacity for the kids to, to uh, know their, their voices count. They can act and influence things that are going on in the world around them. Uh, one of our uh, partners and one of the leaders in this news literacy movement is the News Literacy Project that was founded in, in 2008 by an old LA Times uh, colleague, Alan Miller, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter. And it's now uh, a program that's here in, in Chicago and Washington and New York. And uh, it, it adds the uh, really neat feature of having uh, real journalists uh, come into the classroom and bring to life a lot of these issues with the real news experience. And there are 65 journalists now in the Chicago area that have uh, enrolled and, and volunteered to uh, do this, including from the Tribune and the Sun-Times and, and uh, OI, and it's, it's, a, uh, it's a terrific thing. Now, one more word word on, on this. It's a curriculum that fits inside other existing classes, usually English or history or, or social studies, 
can be done either in a concentrated three weeks or throughout a semester, and um, as well as in after school programs. But uh, rather than just have me talk about, let's uh, listen to a student and a, and a teacher at the uh, North Northside College Prep talk about their experience with the program. <coughs> To really try to make these creative thinkers um, or facilitate them into future problem solvers. And so I thought that accessing people who are on the front lines of current events and of um, you know looking at all sides and being part of problem solving processes and things like that, um, I just thought this program would be a good fit. I feel news literacy is being able to uh, read news or take it in from media, but also um, being able to think critically about it. So not just taking um, news as it is, but also thinking about like what this means and whether the source you got it from is a biased source or if it is not a biased source. I think that because they saw working journalists, they could project a future for themselves where they could become that person. Someone at the AP who edited my article, so it really, um, it really got me to think about my lead and how I'm bringing people into my story. When you meet a journalist and you can see them, it, it becomes so much more possible that you could become that person, that you could follow that story, that you could write that, that she is the same kind of person you were, she went to high school too. So between the News Literacy Project and other News Literacy programs here in Chicago, last year reached uh, 4,000 uh, CPS students through 300 teachers. And in the case of the News Literacy Project, uh, was highly rated by uh, nearly all the teachers who used the program. Um, the News Literacy Project is also working with CPS to d develop a digital version of this that could then be rolled out to many, many, many more. Uh, students. One other attraction of news literacy is that it's extraordinarily good fit with the new Common Core standards that emphasize all exactly these kinds of critical thinking skills and the use and evaluation of non-fiction text. And uh, so we think it has a uh, we think it has a great uh, future. So I'd like to recognize and thank all the partners in the news literacy and youth journalism programs, including uh, several over here today with us, Free Spirit Media, Columbia College, our friends at Roosevelt University, Community Media Workshop, all who are here, thank you for what you do. And a special call out to, to a CPS teacher who has been able to come away for the day, Jill Silvestri, who from the uh, Lindblom School, who uses this. Jill, thank you for what you do with the kids. Stand up, Jill. And good to have you back in school. So today we were also announcing a uh, million dollars in grants to 11 additional organizations to expand the reach and impact of news literacy programs in Chicago. And I can't uh, name all of them, but I want to mention a couple of city colleges of Chicago are going to be extending this work to all seven of their campuses. The Alternative Schools Network, which is a network of charter schools that focus on, on uh, kids who have dropped out of school and are now coming back in, feel that news literacy is a great way to reach and work, work with these kids. And DePaul's Latino Media and Communications Initiative is going to bring news literacy program to students at 15 high schools with significant Latino enrollments. So uh, before closing, I wanted to spend just a minute to frame news literacy as part of the broader context of how we educate the next generation of great citizens. <laughs> news literacy is one part of it. You have to know how to get the information you need to be a smart citizen. But you also need quality civic education as well as opportunity to actually get engaged in, in the life of the community. Civic education always was the historic purpose of 
public schools in our country. But over the last several decades, it's gotten pushed to the sides and in, in some areas eliminated entirely, whether because of funding or the importance, but focus on, on reading and, and math and uh, standardized tests and all of that. But I think we've lost something, and it's hard to prove as big a phenomenon as, as this one, but I can't help but think that the, the lack of quality civic learning in our schools has played a part in the decline of civic health in the country overall. And there is a lot of research that shows that this problem is, is worse in, in urban areas where, the, where so many of the kids don't have the quality civic learning opportunities that kids in the, in the suburbs have. The good news is we can fix this. As we are learning, and with all of so many colleagues in the field, the quality civic education really works, and we know how to do it. Here in Illinois and Chicago, there's a good amount of work going underway. I just want to call out one, and that's the new CPS Global Citizenship Initiative that's being piloted uh, this school, school year in 15 high schools, which are trying to reverse this course of recent history and get the civic mission uh, back in our schools. They're going to have new civic uh, classes and, and uh, quality service and civic engagement opportunities and student participation in the public life of the school. And I think we really want to thank J.C. Brizard and, and uh, John Schmidt, who's for years been a pioneer in the area of, of uh, service learning in the schools. Is John here today? He was going to be. There he is. Stand up, John. Thank you for <laughs> what you do at CPS. And it's, they've made, they've recognized and, and sort of rejected the false choice. We don't need to choose between good, good students and good citizens. They go hand in hand, and the path that CPS is now on is going to show us how that's done. I want to also call out a couple of the community organization partners that are working with CPS on this, including the terrific MICFA Challenge and uh, Facing History in Ourselves who do such a, a great job with our, our kids. Is uh, Bonnie Oberman here today? Bonnie and Brian Brady from MICFA. But I want to call up Bonnie too. If you, if, you haven't, if you haven't been to the Choosing to Participate exhibit down at the Harold Washington Library, run from here after, after lunch and see it. It is a, a terrific exhibit that, that Bonnie and her colleagues have, have brought back to Chicago about the importance and the impact of the civic public choices that we all make. So I wanted to just call out again, Chicago is very fortunate to have a lot of organizations that are doing really, really good work um, in, in the this, in this civic uh, space. And it's something that we all need to be a, a part of. So what can we all do? What can you do? I'd say, first of all, talk to your family and talk to your kids. Make the news something that, and information and the public life something that you, that you talk about as a family. It's uh, our parents and kids or, you know, the first teachers. Make it happen in the home. And then extend that example uh, everywhere, particularly in this network world where everybody emails everybody and shares all their news. Be a role model for being a good consumer of news and information and being, you know, checking out sources and being fair and balanced and don't pass along junk and that sort of thing. Be a, be a, be a, uh, um, a demanding and critical consumer of, of journalism. Make, make, make our media better by what you consume so the market will follow the, the demands of savvy consumers. Find out what your schools are doing. Do they have news literacy? Do they have civic engagement? How's it working in the pilot schools with the new CPS initiative? And um, so many of you have great influence in the public life of the city. Be an advocate. When you find out what's going on and something needs to change, then put it on your personal agenda to do something about it. And finally, there's so many ways personally to contribute time to these or another organization or money. Thomas Dewey said, democracy has to be born anew every generation. 
and education is its midwife. And there are no guarantees. We're not guaranteed the, the next generation will hold on to our freedoms and our democracy. We have to work at it. But what could be more important? Thank you very much. I'll give Joe up here in a second. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, come on up, Alderman Moore. And if there's questions, if you get them up here to Alderman Moore or Brenda. Also, the president of St. Xavier University, Christine Weissman, is here. Christine, where are you? Stand up, why don't you? Give her a round of applause. Thank you. As the questions are coming up, uh, I just have one question. David? What would Colonel McCormick think of the way you are spending the money today at the McCormick Foundation? <laughs> That's a big and important question, including the one, what would his current board of directors <laughs> think about how we're spending their money more immediately? I hope he'd be proud. You know, I think some of the, he'd be surprised by some of the, by some of the twists and turns that, that, that media has taken. But, you know, he was one of the great media innovators. He's the one who got the company into, into radio and, and uh, into, into uh, TV, and then later we got into the Internet. So he would have, he was, a, he was, a, he was an adventurer in, in industry, and so he would have embraced these changes. He would have tried to get into them and own some of them if he could and be successful. And I, I, think, he'd, I think he'd love this work. I hope, I think he'd love this work with kids and the next generation of news consumers. All right, well that was a, a, an, an excellent, excellent presentation. Let's give uh, David another round of applause. All right, as, uh, as Jay indicated, uh, we are now uh, taking questions. So if you have uh, any uh, questions, there are forums on each of the tables and we have uh, uh, folks around the room uh, to pick up your questions. So if you have a question, please write it down uh, and uh, we will be happy to read it. Um, and as someone who has been a lifelong news junkie and was fortunate enough to have parents who took your advice early on and we had news and politics discussed around the dinner table every, every night, uh, I found this talk particularly interesting. So I'm going to have the prerogative here of having Jay given me the microphone for once to uh, ask the first question. And, and the question is, um, what, is uh, what is the future of, of uh, uh, newspapers? And I don't mean the newspaper industry, but that thing you used to hold and get you know, uh, ink on your fingers. What, what is the future of that? That's a question I wrestled with for years and years and years. And uh, many of my colleagues uh, still are. And I think um, quite well. And uh, so I think we're going we're gonna to have newspapers, including print newspapers, for many, many years to come. I think they're going to continue to change. I think the, you know, the p circulation patterns for the print newspaper have been modestly declining for years and, and with, the eight, with the demographics of the overall population. I expect that may, may continue. But, you know, as I think uh, J Jerry has pointed out when, uh, when he's talked about what's going on currently with the Tribune, in terms of total reach and readership, both print and online, it's never been, it's never been bigger. Their newspapers are uh, adapting to being part of this three little pigs world in which it's always on, always present, mobile, and the, the uh, challenge is, of course, to to uh, find the business model to support the work, the important work, including the investigative news work that's expensive and, and nobody else will, will do it. And uh, so building up other sources, probably getting more from subscription revenues and not all from advertising, but certainly mining as much of the digital advertising. Maybe at, at some point uh, finally cracking the code on paid content, which we tried a number of times different ways that I never, we didn't, we didn't, hadn't yet figured out. But, uh, but it's so important that they continue. And I think 
here in Chicago, we're currently very fortunate to be in a multi-newspaper town. Everybody's better off when you have multiple sources of news, particularly when they're investing in, in actually doing good quality journalism. And so hopefully we will in Chicago for many years to come. All right, the um, next question is from City Club member and member of the City Club board, Chris Long. Chris, stand up so everyone can see you. She writes, uh, today's New York uh, Times op-ed page in a column written by a former Chicagoan about the crisis among youth gangs and killings notes that only 17% of philanthropic funds are focused on criminal justice programs. Uh, would you comment on that statistic? 1%, only 1%. Thank you, Chris. I saw that this morning. I thought it was very interesting. And I, I, I didn't get under the data that, that uh, she was using. So I don't know, for example, whether that total amount of philanthropy includes all private donations, including for hospitals and universities and that. But, any, but I took her uh, point, which I think is a good one, that that criminal justice issues are underrepresented and maybe underserved in philanthropy nationally. Um, I will say that happily, and I'm, I'm not, I won't tell you that we, we all invest enough in it here, but uh, Chicago, it turns out, has a number of foundations that are fairly active in areas, areas related to criminal justice and, and violence reduction. Uh, Jay mentioned uh, the Joyce Foundation that Ellen leads. Uh, Mac MacArthur Foundation has uh, some uh, very important work in that area. Uh, the Field Foundation, others, um, Crown. Crown Family uh, uh, Philanthropies. We This has been, in the last several years, an area of increasing um, work for us at the McCormick Foundation, and we've supported the uh, ceasefire organization that's now working with the uh, police department in a few of the hardest hit uh, neighborhoods. We've, uh, a number of us support the uh, really excellent work that's being done at the crime lab down at the University of Chicago, which is trying to tackle this question of how do we really get good evidence about what works and doesn't in the area of, of violence reduction. So. Um, President Preckwinkle and the mayor and their joint work on violence and have, have been bringing some greater attention to the criminal justice uh, system. We spend, and, and President Preckwinkle always points this that we spend something like $3 billion in total in Cook County on everything related to criminal justice, police, prosecutors, prisons, jails, and it's not there are so many opportunities to do things better that will can end some of the continuing cycle of crime and arrest and release and no job and more crime and violence. So I think the point is overall more attention needs to be paid. The good news is in Chicago I think we're, we're, we're doing relatively more and some very good things. But it's a great question. The next question was written by someone who has excellent penmanship, writes in clear block letters, so I don't have to put my reading glasses on. So Graham Grady from Shevsky and Froelich, please uh, stand up and be recognized for your excellent penmanship. We thank you, thank your grade school teacher for that. Uh, Graham uh, writes, what can we do today to groom the next generation of David Hillers in philanthropy and civic leadership? Oh, Graham. Got any, got any uh, club? Yeah. Graham's grant application is up this afternoon. <laughs> oh my gosh. Graham, that's a, uh, the question is, is uh, it's, some of the, it's some of the things we, we talked about earlier, and it's all broadly about education and youth development in the city that so many of you are active in and, and passionate about. There are a number of our colleagues here our, uh, our, our work in the area of early education, working with the youngest, really youngest citizens just as they're starting out. And as so many of you know, that is a critical area and a critical time of development in so much, it turns out, in terms of 
of sort of whether you call it character or social emotional skills that put you on a path that leads to good things versus a path that leads somewhere else are established in those earliest years. And then obviously in, in K, to, K to 12, but I think a, 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 in a very important part will be getting the civics um, back in the schools. And I know we got all sorts of demands on, on time and, and what we're teaching in the schools, but I, I really do think there's, there's uh, no, no substitute for it. And I wanted to find, I've got, uh, but there are three MICFA challenge kid students, college students, who are work on the, uh, the mayor's youth uh, council. Could you guys stand up and be recognized? And <laughs> yes, and that's B. Tran, Augustine Flores, and Paris Jackson. So thank you for being here. And I think that's exactly the kind of, the kind of program. You know, it starts in the home and then in the early years in school and, and continuing on. That's Okay, the next question is from Joyce Saxon, a uh, member and, uh, of the Board of Governors of the City Club. With advertising continuing to decline, how can newspapers afford to stay in business? Well, we, were, we, we t touched on some of that earlier. I think par partly it's finding other, uh, other revenue sources. Can obviously there's, there's a ton of money being made digitally, the on online advertising. The, the challenge is it's spread out over billions and billions of, of, of websites. But the, uh, the efforts to, to replace print revenue with digital revenue is, is, uh, is going strong. But it's not, it's, not, it's not been one for one or nearly one for one. So I think, again, just to repeat, that part of it is more circulation revenue and doing as much as you can and looking at, at opportunity for paid, paid content where what you really want to do is focus your, your business model on the people who really love the news and the content, which they find so valuable, and then have them pay for it, even as advertisers are paying less. OK, the next question is from someone who is not a City Club member. So please note, it comes toward the end of the questions. Uh, <laughs> there's a special priority given to members. Um, uh, this is from George Chung of the Joyce Foundation. Sorry to call you out, George. What is the most important political reform to strengthen Illinois' democracy, and how do we achieve it? George, aren't you in charge of that issue for Joyce? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Ellen, did you put him up to that? Uh, you know, one that's at the, and, and there are, uh, there are several. One that's at the at the top of my list, and or, I don't know, would be at the top of, of my list, and, and I know is one that some of our friends at Change Illinois and, and many of the uh, civic reform groups are doing. Focus on is uh, redistricting, and this issue of taking the taking the trying to take some of the politics out of the the setting of the boundaries of the legislative districts. And there are a number of different ways to, to uh, do this as Iowa commission based, but basically trying to make it less like the spectacle that it's been recurrently in Illinois. With the, uh, I mean, the basic idea is let the, let the voters pick their representatives rather than vice versa in the strange thing where all the lines can be, can be gerrymandered. Because I think what we've seen in that is not only do you get these totally safe districts and people who are around forever, but um, they tend to then migrate to very much blue or very much red and exacerbates the problem of, of polarization and the inability to get anything done in Illinois and, and other states. I do think an interesting other take on this, which I haven't I read some of the stories about candidates who were running, but is the change that was adopted in, in California where they have nonpartisan primaries. And so everybody, Democrats, Republicans, this is for congressional races, right? Yes. And also in the state. 
And so um, whatever your party, you just have at it. And you appeal then to the greatest number of voters. And that has this effect of um, letting more moderate voices, which then turn out to be more popular, in fact, with, a, with large numbers of people, prevail. So I think there are a number of strategies for, for coming at it. But, but some structural improvement of the way our boundaries get set and our candidates get nominated will be an important part of it. Uh, this next question definitely uh, violates uh, City Club rules as I understand them. It's an anonymous question. Um, however, I think it's a good question, so I will adopt it as my own. So asked by uh, the moderator here, Joe Moore, uh, what will be the effect on charitable organizations if the charitable deduction is eliminated? And will that actually happen? That is a big question. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on that in some way, whether it's directly on that specific deduction or in terms of itemized deductions overall. If one hopes there's ever a possibility of some kind of grand s compromise to solve the, uh, the fiscal and, and tax issues, I think the charitable deduction thing is, is plainly will likely be on the table. And I'm also concerned as the whole philanthropy of nonprofit sector is that could have some significant impact on giving. Happily, it's not like the reason everybody gives for every dollar they give. So I think there's a lot of uh, research in the in the in the area that many, many people will continue to be extremely generous with or without the tax deduction. But in this era where there's so much pressure on all the not-for-profits and they're including the, the government funding that's either delayed or, or going away, any significant reduction in the private contributions would be quite harmful. And so the prospect is uh, a little scary. All right, one, one final question, uh, and uh, again, it's, this is one that I have some curiosity about. How do um, today's uh, journalism school graduates compare to those who graduated uh, 30, 40 years ago? That's a great question. And Thank you. It's, what, is, what is that from you, Joe? Know? Uh, you know, and it's, it's not, it's not what, I, what I would have guessed if I hadn't if we, if we didn't have a lot of active relationships with the journalism schools, amazingly, you might conclude, a lot of the journalism schools are doing great. And the, uh, the, the quality of the, of the students who are coming into the schools and are passionate about the same things that journalists have been passionate about for, for decades, but now have to be translated into this kind of world are, uh, the, the, the students are really impressive at places like, uh, like most of the, the j journalism schools in the Chicagoland area that I know. Enrollment is as high as it's ever been. The, ki the, the students are as excited and passionate. What, what is different in part is they're not all planning necessarily to go work at the Chicago Tribune right away as their main thing. They're going to be, along with this fragmentation comes this explosion of opportunities for people to do their own kind of journalism in a lot of different settings. And there's a lot of emphasis on entrepreneurial journalism, because in this environment where there's a whole new world out there, you got to be nimble and you got to be creative. But the people who are, including a lot of the students who are in the journalism schools these days, are going to be extremely successful and help us sort all this out. So I'm hopeful about it. 